slow down just a bit. I had some symptoms. He started with these coughing fits. <coughs> <coughs> Went into the Navy clinic and they prescribed antibiotics, sent me on my way. I just couldn't catch my breath. I went in and saw a third doctor, had the chest x-rays, and it was just so much scar tissue throughout both lobes of the lung. It turned out retired Navy Captain Wayne Bergeron had advanced sarcoidosis. It's a scarring of the lung itself. They don't know what causes it. There is no known cure for it. I didn't know enough about it, so I really wasn't afraid of what I didn't know. Now, do you do any kind of exercise? He didn't realize that over time, his lungs would shut down. When I was first diagnosed, I was still active in all activities. He's always been an athlete, playing football growing up, and staying active in the military and with his son, Corey. You know, coaching Corey on the baseball teams, active with his football. Over time, though, it was hard to keep up because it was hard to breathe. It was getting a little bit worse, a little bit worse, a little bit worse. I went from being active in sports to still active as a coach down to the point where I'm now solely a spectator. He never complains. Anyone could ask him and he will say, I'm doing fine. But he lies to you. I've seen a significant change in him. I've just seen him getting worse. Nearly 10 years after diagnosis, the disease had advanced to the point that doctors urged Wayne to consider a lung transplant. A lung transplant really should be viewed as a last resort. I was a little taken back that we had progressed to that point so early. Some things you just want to put in your back pocket and forget about it. So he said, well, what if we just postpone doing transplantation? If we chose to do nothing, we'd have less than two years. Oh, that was probably the, the worst day that me and Sheila had. It was like, you know, oh my God, we're actually looking at uh, a timeline, a, a finite timeline. If he didn't have it done, he wouldn't live. Even if he had it done, there are no guarantees. It's well recognized that the lung transplant is the riskiest transplant. Of the major transplants, there is no backup, really. So when the lung transplant fails, it's a dire situation. But Wayne was determined to try everything possible to be there for his son, Corey. They graduate from high school, they go on to college. You know, their first loves, you know, you want to be there, you want to share in those. So whatever time this will extend, I mean, it's, it's more than a blessing, more than what I would have had. As a Navy veteran, Wayne is entitled to free medical treatment for serving the country. Went to the Navy and became a Supply Corps officer, which is a business manager for the Navy. He worked his way up the ranks, earning two master's degrees and 12 medals along the way to becoming a captain. I've seen many foreign countries, a lot of cultures. My Navy career has probably been the pinnacle of my life. It's rare that you find a job that you truly love and they actually pay you. It was a job he loved for 26 and a half years before illness forced him to retire. As the Bergerons investigated treatment options, they realized they didn't have many. Private hospitals weren't willing to put Wayne on the transplant list yet, and only one veterans hospital in the country even had a lung transplant program. It was in Madison, Wisconsin, but the Bergeron's home is in Fairhaven, Massachusetts. The requirement was before they would list us that we would actually have to reside here. If he did relocate, the Madison VA hospital was willing to put him on the transplant list immediately. <coughs> It's tough because uh, would I prefer to have stayed home in Massachusetts? Yeah, because there's a greater sense of normalcy while you're sitting in your own house. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the way the cards felt. So the Bergerons chose to join other veterans waiting for transplants in Madison. My experience with them, it's been top notch. VA has contracted with UW. So I'm getting civilian care and the VA is picking up the cost. It's a tremendous team effort. 
Dr. Richard Cornwell is the medical director of the lung transplant program for both UW Hospital and Madison VA Hospital. We have the great fortune of having our VA hospital directly connected to the university hospital. I see it as a privilege to be able to take care of, of veterans. These are people that made a commitment and dedicated themselves to this country. Now their lives depend on what happens here in the next few months. And, and we're just waiting, waiting, waiting. After the first two weeks, I was like, wow, I thought it was going to be fast. Then a month came. I said, well, that wasn't too bad. But now that we're ho hovering around two months, it's kind of like, ooh, I, I wish something would happen soon. But you got to put it in perspective. We've got individuals that are here that have been here seven, eight months. Veterans like Michelle Cook and Dexter Shoulders. I'm waiting for a heart. I had congestive heart failure. All my lung tissues is all scarred up. When this oxygen runs out, that's it. I have to stay right there. If I don't have a backup, I cannot move. Sometimes I, I lay in bed and I get emotional. When I come together with the people right here, I guess it, it takes my mind off of it most of the time. We all have something in common, you know, knowing that we serve the country. We are family right now, so we know we look out for each other now. We pray for each other. Yeah, got to. If we hadn't seen that soldier, we got to go check on him. <laughs> There's friendship and camaraderie here, but they all long to be home. Wayne has only seen his son, Corey, a few days here and there. And what he misses most are the small things. You know, looking at the clock at 10 minutes to 3, knowing he's getting off the bus. Watching him, you know, taking him to the practice, taking him to the games. Most people say, gee, that's such a drag. You know, I'm a family chauffeur. Those are, those are the best days. So I actually get to see him. What? You know, developing was a, a young man. He's graduating from eighth grade this year. His birthday's this summer. He keeps bringing up in conversation, will dad be home, will dad be home? There's nothing I can't give him an answer. With each passing week, Wayne's health is deteriorating. Uh, there's good days and there's bad days. Getting up from bed, getting dressed is a chore. His lungs are getting stiff, so it would literally be like if somebody took a strap across your chest and just kept tightening it. Okay, go a little bit slower because this is an incline here. I'm limited to how far the oxygen tank will last. I now have the need for constant oxygen. You know, you just move on and think tomorrow's going to be a better day. There's no turning back. So we have to move forward. Three times a week, retired Navy Captain Wayne Bergeron exercises. But this is no ordinary workout. The exercise he did wore him out for you know a good rest of the day to a, probably another day after that. At this point, Wayne can barely breathe because his lungs are so scarred by sarcoidosis. Hook your hand like that. But he still works hard at physical therapy. And that's no easy thing to do. I mean, the last thing anybody wants to do when they can't breathe is exercise. He was very, very sick, but he seems to be a person with tremendous coping skills. He knows he needs to build up strength now to speed his recovery if he's lucky enough to get the lung transplant. I'm relatively young. I'm healthy. My whole philosophy is give me a second chance and I'm going to fine-tune the body even better than what it was before and hopefully I'm going to be the record setter. But to get there, he needs donor lungs to become available soon. I'm hoping for that magical phone call real soon. But 12 weeks go by until finally, five months after arriving in Madison, Wayne gets the call, waking him at 1 a.m. I took it in, um, sat up on the bed for a little bit. I had a little bit of anxiety, started to get a little worked up. You're at 115. And then I just, you know, quartered myself down. I was nervous. I didn't know what to do. 
Michelle and Corey were waiting for news back home in Fairhaven. It was now like 3, 4 in the morning. I hadn't heard anything. Because there isn't much to tell. Wayne has been prepped and is just waiting for surgery. I'm wide awake, I'm not exhausted. You know, and I've only had a couple hours sleep. I try not to dwell on the magnitude of the surgery. You know? but there's really no sense you know, worrying about what I have no control over. What he is thinking about is what a successful transplant will allow him to do. That's going to be where I become the person I used to be. Get back with Corey's activities. Get back in the backyard, play catch with him, toss the football with him. Those images keep him going as he waits through the night. And it's now 8 o'clock in the morning and still no word on when we're going to get into the uh, operating room. I didn't think it would go on to as long as it has, but they said this is normal. I'm going to stay positive. I don't want to get depressed. I will have a lifetime ahead of me, so these few minutes are insignificant. But the minutes turn into hours, and nothing's happening. Finally, the doctor arrives with news. As soon as the nurse closed the door, I assumed it wasn't good news. It was that afternoon they, he called me and he said, we have bad news. Uh, they had to cancel, cancel surgery. Unfortunately, the donor lungs uh, were determined to be unsuitable, that they weren't reaching the appropriate oxygen levels. I laid on the bed and started crying because all I thought was, now when, when is it going to happen now? Lungs are notoriously delicate, and it's estimated nearly 80% of donated lungs are unsuitable for transplant. There's nothing you can do about it, so just accept it. And as all the people have said, you know, when my time is here, when they get the right organs, you know, that'll be the day. He only hopes that day comes soon. Uh, where we were anticipating it to happen within a month, two months, and it's already been six months. I mean, you know, that's been wearing heavy. I think he had in the back of his head that I don't have much time. There is a dire shortage for donated lungs. Nationally, more than 1,600 people are on the waiting list. And each year, approximately 240 people die waiting for a lung to become available. <coughs> the clock's ticking for most of us. The closer I get, obviously, the anxiety is going to be creeping up a little more, a little more, a little more. Everybody that's waiting, obviously, we're on pins and needles. We talk about it in a sense of being reborn again, you know, having that second chance at life. Fifteen hours after getting the call, there's nothing to do but go back to waiting. Just re-prepare myself for the, the next phone call. And hopefully it'll come soon. I, mean, I had a gut feeling yesterday before I went to bed. Uh, I said, I think we're going to get a call. And just a few hours later, at 6.30 a.m., Wayne Bergeron's phone rang. It was the Madison VA Hospital telling him to come in and get ready. Donor lungs may be available. And he said, um, I got the call. So I said, shut up. I couldn't believe it. Five weeks earlier, Wayne got a similar call. But those lungs didn't work out, and surgery was canceled. He's ready for anything this time. What I didn't want to do is set myself up. But right away, everything just feels different. There was less urgency last time, more urgency this time. He's only in the hospital a few hours before he's moved closer to the operating room. All the blood work, lab work, it's all been completed. They were moving so fast this time. Go all the way down to the T intersection. I think it's going to happen this time. Though Wayne doesn't know it, the lung has already arrived at UW Hospital and is being rushed through the halls to the operating room. Finally, he gets the news he's waited six months to hear. The surgery is a go. He sent me a text. It was very emotional, just, you know, to make sure, like I told Corey, how important that he was, that he always wanted the best for us. I'm ready. 
I won't be aware of what's going on, so there's no sense worrying. I'm kind of ready to just roll in. The surgery will take about eight hours as the UW transplant team goes about the delicate business of removing Wayne's lung and replacing it with a donor organ. Between the UW and the VA hospital, we do approximately 35 lung transplants per year. Though he was waiting for a set of lungs, Wayne is receiving a single rather than a double lung transplant. One lung became available and, and we, we grabbed that opportunity. He really didn't have a choice. Time was kind of running short. He was fortunate that he got his lung transplant when he did, um, because I don't know how many more months he could have gone on. It was coming close. I kept just telling myself, it, it's going to come. Wayne is fortunate. The organ did come in time. That's not true for hundreds of people each year. If all goes well, this is the beginning of Wayne's new life. When I sat up in the bed and they were checking the lungs, you take that first true deep breath, and it's like, wow, you know, no, no resistance. It was like, wow, I, I've got my life back. He was taken off oxygen within one day. Good. He looked great. Well, it's always good when you walk into a room and someone's off oxygen and they're smiling and their color looks good and they stand up and they shake your hand. In days, he is up and walking and pushing the envelope. They said, oh, we'll just walk once around the nurse's station. I said, well, can we continue? So we ended up doing four extended laps. The way he exercised today, it'd be hard to tell that he had surgery. It's unusual for someone to be this high level one week out of their transplant. But Wayne's a man with a mission, working overtime to get home to his son, Corey. Michelle and I went downstairs, toured around the first floor, went outside, went down the bottom of the hill and came back up the hill and wasn't winded. I wish I could take uh, some of uh, Wayne's attitude and spread it around. Uh, perfect. Yeah. If I was grading him, you know, he'd be probably nearly a perfect score at this point. Wayne is one of many success stories. Since the start of the program at Madison VA Hospital and UW Hospital, nearly 200 veterans have received lung transplants. I'm not sure what might have happened to them if they hadn't come to us. Both Dexter Shoulders and Michelle Cook have received their transplants, and Michelle is ready to head home. All right, tell Corey. Bye. 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 See you later. Okay. Bye. 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 The thought of this day kept her going for many months. Oh, I just can't wait to go and do aerobics. I want to walk around my house with no oxygen. Walk my dog. Bye. Good luck, you guys. Right. I'm going to do it all. I'm going to do it all. It's my, it'll be my second chance. But all the lung transplant patients will have to be diligent to stay healthy. The greatest risk isn't here in the operating room. The greatest uh, risk comes from the complications. Rejection and also infection. Anti-rejection medications have to be taken lifelong. There will always need to be dedication. Five-year survival statistic is roughly 50%. I'm optimistic that I will be the one that goes beyond that point. That's why he's been working so hard from the beginning. And hopefully I'm going to be the record setter. I'd like to see me make, you know, 15 years. We want them all to do well, and uh, we're going to do our darndest to help them. Typically, veterans recover at the Madison VA Hospital for nearly three months, but Wayne is way ahead of schedule. I know getting back home is right around the corner. And once he's settled, he plans to write to the donor's family to see if they want to hear from him. He'd like to tell them. How truly thankful I am. They had to make a decision probably at the most traumatic time of their lives. And he wants them to know the impact of that decision. And I've thought about, now what am I going to do now? Well, I can guarantee you I'm going to be the best dad, best husband, and best person. I'm not going to squander the gift. Wayne went home on October 6th, nine months after arriving at Madison VA Hospital. He paid a surprise visit to his son Corey's football game, showing up to open the game with a coin toss.